What is up everyone? My name is Joseph and welcome back to another episode of Understanding CEDH where it's our goal to give you the information that you need in order to play and sit at these higher power tables. These videos are geared on the more introductory level, but the topics we go over can also be helpful for those who are maybe a little bit more experienced in the scene. That being said, today we're going to talk about how to build a mana base for CEDH and we're going to break it down to be a little bit simpler than our previous episodes and we're going to just give you five tips on things that you should keep in mind when building your land base for your CEDH or higher power deck. Now before we get into the tips, I do have a few quick promotions as always. We have a merch store now as well as playmats available if you want to check that out, link in the description. We also have a Patreon if you'd like to help support us financially, link is in the description for that as well. Next, if you want to watch our gameplays live, we have been streaming quite frequently while we've been quarantined, so head on over to our Twitch channel to catch those games live if that's something that you're interested in. If you're going to be buying cards in the near future, there's a TCG affiliate link in the description. If you plan on buying cards in the near future, after clicking on that link, any purchase you make helps out the channel at no cost to you and finally if you want to get to know us a little better and join our community we have a discord link in the description now with the self shilling out of the way let's get into our five tips for building an efficient and effective mana base for higher powered or cedh decks the first tip we have for you today seems a little obvious but it does get a little bit more complicated and that tip is make sure you have enough mana producing sources these can be lands mana dorks artifacts just make sure you have enough of them now that's really easy to say, but it's a little bit harder to actually do. For example, if you are coming from a more casual scene, you may be wondering why competitive decks or higher powered decks only run 29 or 30 lands. Well, it's for some very good reasons. First, they usually run a lot of cheap artifact and mana dork ramp that helps supplement the lands. Second, the games don't generally last super long, so land specific ramp is not always as reliable as the games may not make it long enough for your 36 or 38 lands to be super relevant. And another reason is that the, the decks are so packed with efficiency that you only want to draw realistically the exact number of lands that you can play per turn and really not anymore. The goal of these higher power decks is to keep your hand as full of gas as possible. So having excess lands in your hand is not super helpful when the game may not last long enough for you to play all of those lands. So those are just some of the reasons on why we want to keep a slim and efficient mana base. But how are we supposed to know when we have enough mana producing sources? One way is to do the math manually and see how often you'll draw certain mana sources so you'll know if you'll draw enough over the course of a game. It does take some experience to know how fast your deck is looking to be based on its overall CMC and the win conditions and just how long these games normally last in general. But overall, I have found this to be fairly efficient in calculating when to cut lands and when to add ramp. Another way to figure out this balance is to just base it off of play experience. After a few games or after just looking at enough deck lists, you'll get a feel for how much ramp and how many lands you'll realistically need to add into your deck. It is highly dependent on the players in your meta, the types of stacks pieces they run, the average CMC of your deck and your general win cons, but after some research and after some playing, it is generally fairly easy to get a good feel for what you should and shouldn't add. That being said, if you are new to the scene, we actually have a tool that I've developed that should give you a little bit of a crutch and a little bit of a step in the right direction. It's a calculator that helps you determine how many average mana sources you will have over the course of a game. Now, quick disclaimer, I did build this in about a day and a half, so it's not perfect and there may be some issues. However, it is an open source project and it's just a very simple website. So if you want to take a look at the source code and make some additions to it yourself, you're more than welcome to. The links for both the code repository and the page are in the description, but let me just take a few seconds just to overview this calculator and describe how it works. Ideally, it should be pretty straightforward as I wanted to keep it as simple as possible, but simply put, this webpage will allow you to add the number of lands, mana rocks, and mana dorks that you have in your deck, and it will show you how many you should expect to see per draw. So once you hit calculate, it'll show you the number of lands, artifacts, and mana dorks you should expect to see by draw number seven, which would be an opening hand, and then you can continue down and go as many draws deep as you want. There are some advanced filters that will be there on release. There may be more in the future if you're watching this weeks or months after this video is released. But for now, there are some advanced filters that allow you to put in the number of mana pips that your sources produce. And if you do this, the calculator will also show the chances of your mana sources producing the different types of mana. So the goal with this is so you can use it as a general guideline to know how many mana sources you need to add into your deck 
and just give you a little bit of an idea of what types of colors you should expect to see by the different draws. For example, if by your opening hand you have two lands and there's a 70% chance for those to be red, each of those two lands has a 70% chance to produce red mana. Now, there are some intricacies with this calculator. For example, if you have a rainbow colored land like a City of Brass, you will have to increase each of the possible colors other than colorless to have it calculate correctly because it can produce all the different types of mana. And another quick thing is only add colorless only lands and artifacts to the colorless column when submitting your data. Just because a City of Brass can produce all colors and can be used for colorless mana, you shouldn't add it to that column. So there'll be more instructions on the page when it's released, and you may see some more updates on the Discord or on the Twitter about this calculator, but I did want to just show you guys this in a simple guide on how to use it, and I hope you guys will find it helpful. I really initially wanted to build this as I found it would be something that would help me as I go through and do a lot of the math by hand, and this kind of just simplifies it all in one place. So if you have any suggestions, feedback, anything like that, you can leave it in the comments, you can leave it on the issues tab on GitHub, or you can contact us on Twitter. And if you're interested with helping improve this project, I will be using this as kind of my pet project for the next few months, working on it, tweaking it, improving it. And if you want to help out, it's open source, so you're more than welcome to. I may start another channel on our Discord if there's enough people interested where we talk about feature requests and stuff like that. But I'm going to stop talking about it now. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments. And let's move on to tip number two. So now that we have the correct amount of mana sources in our deck, we need to make sure to avoid lands that enter the battlefield tapped. Now there are a few exceptions of lands that are good lands that have a condition where they can enter tapped, but in general you want to make sure that when you pull your opening 7, you're not going to be stuck with multiple lands that don't let you immediately progress your board state. You don't want to lose tempo by having to play a tapped land on turn 1, and then having to wait till turn 2 to really do anything. There are some lands that that have easy conditions to enter untapped, and those I would even strongly consider against playing unless it's in a very specific deck. For example, Glacial Fortress, which only requires an island or a plains, can still be relatively hard to achieve, especially if you pull it in your opening hand, and you should really be focusing on optimizing your land base for your opening hand, because you want to make sure that you can start the game as early as possible and start getting value as early as possible. So just in general, avoid tap lands. Something like a shock land that does have a condition where it can enter untapped is not considered a tap land because realistically you're always going to be paying the life for that to enter untapped. But outside of that, you should really focus and really put a lot of thought into it before you add a, a tap land that isn't a very easy condition to satisfy. Like I said, the check lands are probably on the edge and in certain decks you can probably run it if you really need that extra dual land, but a lot of times a simple basic can go much farther than having one of these lands that will enter the game tapped half the time. The same principle should generally be used for artifacts or mana rocks in general, however it's much less likely that you're going to play a tapped mana rock as many of them just aren't worth running anyway. Something like a worn power stone is not only expensive CMC, but is slow because it enters tapped. So the same principle goes for those, but it's much less likely you'll run into a situation where you really want to add that tapped artifact. If you are in that situation, think long and hard about it because most of the times it's not worth it unless you can specifically and reliably untap at the same turn it goes in, or if there's a specific reason that you have it in your deck. Now, mana dorks are kind of the exception to this because, you know, they don't enter tapped, but they enter with summoning sickness, so you can't use them till the next turn. However, generally, mana dorks as a whole are cheaper costed, so their CMC is lower than most mana rocks. Not the, not the cheaper, the free mana rocks, but most mana rocks. You can generally get more 1 CMC dorks than 1 CMC rocks. So the fact that they enter with summoning sickness can be excused because they are so mana efficient. That being said, that's our talk on lands and mana sources that slow your tempo or enter tapped, so let's move on to tip number three. The third tip we have is be very cautious about adding lands specifically that only tap for colorless mana, even if they do have a good utility attached to it. Now, sometimes the utility is very good, for example, Emergence Zone in certain decks can be incredibly helpful, and it does only tap for a colorless, so that one sometimes gets by, but a card like Reliquary Tower, where it only ever produces colorless and the effect really isn't that strong, is generally never worth adding. Generally, the mana costs in a higher powered or competitive deck is going to have very few colorless symbols just in general, so having these colorless lands are sometimes just useless, where you 
you really need that one black pip, but you only have a colorless land available, generally the utility of the colorless lands just isn't worth it more times than not. Even a card like Strip Mine, which can have fantastic uses in the right decks, you should still think long and hard before adding that to your deck because half the time, if that card is just going to be useless as colorless mana, the effect generally isn't worth it. Like I said, cards like Emergence Zone do have some niche spots, and some really good colorless cards like Ancient Tomb or Gemstone Caverns should be added into decks as they're exceptionally good, but except for those exceptions and the niche cards, you should really be wary about adding colorless lands to your deck, just because like the tap lands, they really reduce your tempo and can really slow down your early gameplay, and you want to make sure that you're playing things, like I said, as fast as possible and as consistently as possible. Piggybacking off of that thought, we have tip number four, which is always make sure your colors are properly allocated. This goes hand in hand with the previous tip where we talked about not having too many colorless producing lands in your deck, and this just takes it a step further. Not only do you need to make sure that you don't end up with useless colorless lands that you can't use, you need to make sure that the lands that you do add that do tap for colors are tapping for the right colors. Doing this generally isn't too difficult as many deck building websites will give you a breakdown of how many colors colored pips you have in your spells, so it's fairly easy to take those colored pip allocations and just build your mana base around it and just make sure you have enough colors to go around. Now you may run into a situation where you're playing a four color deck and your red splash color only has three or four pips, so you don't want to add too many red producing lands, and the way around this is to add rainbow lands like City of Brass and Mana Confluence and correctly optimizing your dual lands so you're able to, for example, fetch up a Steam Vents which will normally tap for a blue, but in that rare situation is able to tap for a red. So optimizing your dual lands and adding as many rainbow lands as possible is a good way to get around a situation where you only have a few pips of a certain color in your deck. Outside of just using that graph, I have found it very helpful to just play test hands, just draw seven cards and just play by yourself for a while to see if you're struggling on certain colors of mana. Goldfishing or playtesting can just be a good way to not only get comfortable with your deck, but also see if your lands and mana base is allocated correctly, and it's quick. It's easy to just draw seven cards, see if you can play them all, play a turn or two in by yourself, and then just shuffle them back up. It's relatively simple, quick, and can give you a good idea of what your deck can do. As a final option, I do want to quickly plug the calculator that we have built again, because as of right now, there is a section that allows you to put in the colors of your lands, artifacts, and mana dorks, and it will basically give you a percentage to say every land you pull has a 20% chance to produce red mana, for example. So you can use that as kind of a guideline or an outline to build your mana or your color sources off of. That being said, that does wrap it up for this tip, so let's move on to our final tip for this video. And last but not least, we have tip number five, which is a quick one, and it's just don't be afraid to take damage from your lands. Generally, a lot of the good lands come with a negative that you can kind of ignore. For example, Mana Confluence, City of Brass, all the shock lands, they deal damage to you, sure, and that can be very negative in certain pods or certain games. But in general, with the number of turns that these games are expected to play at, let's say three through eight, you're not going to be taking too much damage from these lands, and it's not going to, on average, affect your games too much. Having access to the right colors at the right time will be much more beneficial than not taking damage from your lands. So don't be afraid to add the rainbow lands that deal damage, or shock lands, or the horizon lands that deal damage every time they tap for color, or the pain lands that deal damage every time they tap for color. Those can all be super effective in giving you the colors you need at the right time, and the damage, I don't want to say is negligible, because there have been times where I personally have taken quite a bit of damage from my lands, but the trade-off of having the right colors when I need them is much more impactful and helpful than the damage is negative to my overall game plan. I generally add these rainbow lands and all the shock lands in any deck that goes more than three colors because sometimes it can be hard to get that third color or that least used color. So taking a few more points of damage over the course of the game is almost always worth it if it lets you cast the spell that you need when you need to cast it. There are some situations where you may want to pull back on some of these stipulations, for example, a super heavy ad nauseum deck or a deck that really wants to utilize its life for card draw, but those are kind of the edge cases and you should play those by ear and playtest those to know if your lands 
are damaging you too much and if you don't maybe need to add all of the rainbow lands for that specific deck so that's more of an edge case and i would take that on a case-by-case -case basis and as the general rule make sure first that you have the colors that you need in your land base even if they deal damage to you and then pull back based on how the deck plays and what the overall goal is so that wraps up our five tips for building a higher powered or competitive mana base. Following these tips isn't the be all end all to building your mana base, but if you do follow these guidelines, it will give you a really good starting point for whatever deck it is you're building. These are the tips that I follow when I build my mana base, and I give these tips as advice when people ask me, you know, why do you run 28 lands in this deck and 30 in this deck? So we hope this video was helpful for you if you're in the situation where you're deck building and you just wanted some clarification or just a little bit of guidance. That being said, that is all we have for this video. We do hope you enjoyed it. I am Joseph, this is Casually Competitive MTG, and we will see you next time.